Hello and welcome to the presentation. In this video, we will go through practice questions on pharmacological management, specifically focusing on metformin and acarbose. If you haven't done yet, please subscribe and also follow us on Twitter and Facebook for updates, tips, and practice questions. All right, question number one. RT, a 52-year-old male, has been recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. His doctor prescribed him metformin, 500 mg, three times a day. His current A1C is 7.8%. All of the following are true in regards to metformin except. So A, maximum dose is 2,550 mg per day. It can be safely used if the EGFR is less than 30 ml per minute. Avoid use in hepatic failure. And finally, may be used as an alternative to insulin during pregnancy. Choose your answer and let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's go through each answer. So for the first one, A, maximum dose is 2,550 milligrams per day. That is correct. Uh, with metformin, generally, you want to start out on a low dose and titrate up slowly. For example, a person may start out with 500 milligrams twice a day or three times a day, and the dose will be titrated up slowly in small increments up to the desired dose. Again, this will vary depending on the patient and also the prescriber. We generally want to titrate up slowly this will allow the body to get used to the medication as well as minimize the side effects, especially the stomach related side effects such as the diarrhea. The next one is uh, incorrect. So we do not want to use metformin if the EGFR is less than 30 mils per minute. Uh, in this situation, you want to use an alternative agent. If the EGFR is above 30, metformin can be used. Um, again, the dose adjustments may be needed. For example, if it's the GFR is 30 to 44 milliliters per minute, a dose adjustment may be needed. Uh, and and this, the dose adjustment will uh, vary depending on the person's stage of renal failure. The next one is avoid use in hepatic failure. That is correct, yes, because in, uh, metformin also has this mechanism within the liver. And with hepatic failure, this can also have the risk of lactic acidosis. Finally, may be used as an alternative to insulin during pregnancy. Yes, that is true. So with metformin in gestational diabetes, generally insulin uh, can be used as a first-line uh, therapy. If it's not tolerated, for example, metformin can be used as an alternative to insulin. Again, the woman should be uh, told that it can also cross the placenta. Although the, uh, the woman may be on metformin, uh, many times, insulin may still be needed to help adequately control the blood glucose levels. Question number two. All of the following are true in regards to metformin, except A. It is weight neutral, has a low risk of hypoglycemia, enhances insulin release from the pancreas, and finally, first line for many people with type 2 diabetes. Choose your answer and let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's go through each answer. So for A, metformin is classed as way neutral. That is correct. It has a low risk of hypoglycemia. The risk of hypoglycemia is quite rare with metformin. It does not, its mechanism doesn't involve releasing insulin from the pancreas, like the sulfonylureas or maglitinides. The risk of hypoglycemia may be present when metformin is used alongside another drug that has the risk of hypoglycemia, such as a sulfonylurea, a maglitinide, or even insulin. The next one enhances insulin release from the pancreas. That is incorrect. This is the mechanism that, uh, for the sulfonylureas and also maglitinides. Metformin's uh, mechanism involves the enhancement of insulin sensitivity uh, within the tissues. So for example, in the muscle tissue, it helps the body to better respond to the insulin in the body so that the tissue can uptake and utilize the glucose. It also helps to enhance the insulin sensitivity in the liver and helps to decrease the hepatic glucose production or helps to decrease the gluconeogenesis. Furthermore, the other mechanism also involves decreasing the amount of glucose absorbed from the intestine. And finally, first line for many people with type 2 diabetes, that is correct. Generally, metformin is it's safe, uh, it's a low cost, it has a few side effects. The main side effects t that tend to be bothersome are the uh, uh, stomach-related side effects. And it also has some possible heart benefits. Question number three. Which vitamin may become depleted with metformin use? 
A, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, B9 or folic acid. Finally, vitamin D. Take a second and choose your answer. So the answer here is vitamin B12. Let's go to the next slide and discuss this in a little bit more detail. All right, so let's go through a simplistic diagram of how metformin affects uh, B12 absorption. So here we have the small intestine here and more specifically the ileum. So here we have a close-up of an ileal cell and this is where B12 absorption occurs in the ileum. And in order for B12 to be absorbed, it requires another protein or enzyme called intrinsic factor. This complex to be absorbed is a calcium dependent process. When this occurs, this allows for the B12 to be absorbed and transported to the liver, transported to the liver for storage. Metformin uh, inhibits this calcium dependent absorption of the B12 and, and intrinsic uh, factor complex. And when this occurs, this uh, reduces the B12 from being absorbed and in turn this will affect the B12 levels. Many times when people are on metformin, they may require uh, B12 uh, supplementation as well. Question number four. A patient with a vitamin B12 deficiency may present with which of the following symptoms? A. Pins and needles, fatigue, pale skin, or all of the above. Take a moment and choose your answer. All right, so the answer here is D, all of the above. With vitamin B12, it plays a crucial role for normal nerve functioning. It plays a key role with neurotransmitter synthesis. If there's any deficiency in B12, this will affect our nerves, leading to pins and needles, numbness or tingling, muscle weakness, and inadequate levels of uh, B12 can also affect our red blood cells. And this in turn can impair our oxygen delivery to the, uh, to the body, leading to tiredness, fatigue. It can also give rise to pale skin as well. Question number five. Ty is on metformin and his doctor recently started him on a carbose. Which of the following points is true in regards to a carbose? A. He is at more risk for hypoglycemia with this new agent. To treat hypoglycemic event, table sugar, sucrose, can be used. C. It enhances insulin secretion. Finally, D. It delays the digestion of ingested carbohydrates by inhibiting, inhibiting alpha-glucosidase enzyme. Take a moment and choose your answer. So for the first one, A, he is at more risk of hypoglycemia with this new agent. That's incorrect. B, to treat a hypoglycemic event, table sugar can be used. That is also incorrect. We will discuss this in the coming slide. It enhances insulin secretion. Uh, no, that's incorrect as well. Its mechanism is different. That's uh, shown in the next answer, which is D. It's an alpha-glucosidase enzyme inhibitor. Let's go to the next slide and we'll discuss each option in a little bit more detail. All right, so let's go through each option. So for A, the risk of hypoglycemia. The risk of hypoglycemia is quite negligible with a carbose. It doesn't, it's, with this mechanism, it doesn't involve uh, causing the pancreas to release insulin, unlike the sulfonylureas or the maglitonides, which they have the risk of hypoglycemia. For B, the treating a hypoglycemic event using table sugar or sucrose, we need to remember that the mechanism behind our carbose is that it inhibits an enzyme, and that's the alpha-glucosidase enzyme. This enzyme plays a key role in breaking apart disaccharide, disaccharides. So for example, uh, sucrose, uh, maltose. And remember what's with sucrose, it's a glucose molecule bonded to a fructose molecule. In order for the glucose to be released, it needs, that bond needs to be cleaved. And that is done by the glucosidase enzyme. But when a carbose is inhibiting this enzyme, the glucose enzyme cannot be released, therefore it cannot be absorbed from the gut. So that's the mechanism behind it. So we wouldn't use sucrose uh, in a person on a carbose. Uh, in this situation, to treat a hypoglycemic event, the alternatives would be, for example, using milk, honey, or also using dextrose tablets. So this is uh, very important to know. And we'll discuss this in a, little bit, uh, a little bit further in the coming slide. If a person was not on a carbose, then yes, sugar, sucrose, can be used as an option. Remember, sucrose is in uh, many things. It could be in juice, it could be in soft drinks, it can be in candy, and these are uh, some points to be aware of. Uh, next, it enhances insulin secretion. We know that's incorrect. That's the mechanism of the sulfonylureas or the maglitonides. And finally, D, we've already highlighted this already, that the uh, mechanism is that it inhibits alpha-glucosidase enzyme. 
Uh, it also inhibits the pancreatic amylase, uh, which also plays a key role in uh, breaking down starches. Let's go to the next slide and uh, see if we can uh, shed some more light on this. So here we're going to go through just the uh, how carbohydrates are broken down or digested, a simplistic diagram. So here we have long chain carbohydrate or polysaccharide. An example would be something like starch, which is a long chain of sugar molecules. This is going to be broken down in the gut into uh, disaccharides, for example. And this is going to be done by the uh, alpha amylase enzyme. So we have a disaccharide, which is two uh, uh, molecules joined together. Examples are something like uh, maltose. There's also, as we discussed earlier, sucrose as well. From here, the disaccharide will be further broken down into its individual units. So that will be like monosaccharides. For example, this could be uh, glucose molecules. And this is done by the alpha glucosidase enzyme, as we highlighted earlier with the mechanism behind uh, a carbose. Now, when it's broken down into the individual units, the glucose can then be absorbed into the blood. Remember, with a carbose, its mechanism is that it inhibits the alpha amylase as well as the alpha glucosidase. When these are inhibited, this will, we will not get the breaking down of these sugar molecules and we'll get less of the sugar being absorbed into, into the uh, blood. So these will just pass through the gut instead rather than being absorbed. Here we have some examples of disaccharides. So here we have sucrose as well as maltose. And we can see here with sucrose, it's a glucose and a fructose molecule bonded together, whereas maltose is two glucose molecules bonded together. And we've highlighted earlier that these bonds are broken by the alpha glucosidase enzyme. When these are cleaved in these sites right here, this releases the glucose and allows it to be absorbed into the blood. Remember, our carbose inhibits this enzyme, so this cleavage does not occur. Therefore, the glucose is not released. Therefore, it's not uh, absor be able to be absorbed into the blood. Now, remember for treatment, we highlighted that uh, milk, honey, and dextrose tablets can be used for treating a hypoglycemic event when a person's on a carbose. Now, with milk, remember, it contains glucose and galactose. And in order for this bond to be cleaved, it requires the lactase enzyme. It doesn't require glucose, uh, the glucosidase enzyme, and a carbose does not inhibit the lactase enzyme. Therefore, if someone takes milk or drinks milk, then this bond can still be cleaved and the glucose can be released into glucose and galactose, and the glucose can then be absorbed into the blood. Furthermore, with honey, it contains glucose and also fructose, but they're not bound together. They're separate uh, individual monosaccharides, so the glucose can still be absorbed into the blood. So here we have a summary slide of a carbose and the mechanism behind it. This is a simplified diagram. Some details have been left out. This is just to help in understanding. So we have the intestinal lumen here, the enterocyte brush border, the blood vessel, and we have a glucose transporter. So we know with carbohydrates such as starch, sucrose, and maltose, the end product when they're broken down is glucose. And the enzymes involved are the alpha glucosidase and as well as the alpha amylase enzyme. And from there, the glucose can then be absorbed into the blood. When we're treating a hypoglycemic event in a person on a carbose, we want to use specific uh, treatments. So that can involve using milk, as we highlighted earlier, which contains glucose and galactose bonded together. And this bond is broken by the lactase enzyme. This will then release glucose, which can then be absorbed. Remember, a carbose does not inhibit the lactase enzyme. It only inhibits these enzymes right here. And for this reason, milk can be used uh, in treating a hypoglycemic event. Next is that we have honey and the dextrose tablets, which is just glucose. And remember with honey, it has glucose and fructose as separate entities. So there's no bond to be broken here. The glucose can just be absorbed. And we already know a carbose mechanism, it's inhibiting these enzymes. So by delaying the digestion of carbohydrates, a carbose helps to slow down the glucose absorption and can also help to reduce the postprandial blood glucose rise. So let's just summarize the key points about metformin. These are important to be familiar with. So generally metformin is one of the first choices to use in type 2 diabetes, uh, unless contraindicated. Generally it's the first choice because of its safety profile, its cost effectiveness, and possible heart benefits as well. It also has a low uh, side effect profile, but the stomach related side effects tend to be common, such as nausea and diarrhea, which can be, which can be bothersome for, for many people as well. So for this reason, we want to start low and titrate up slowly. This will allow the drug, the body to get used to the drug. And that could take uh, one to two weeks, for example. 
We have already highlighted the max dose is uh, 2,550 milligrams per day. And one of the benefits uh, is with metformin is that there's a low risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, it's also weight neutral. With uh, metformin, remember, we have to be familiar with that it can cause B12 deficiency. So if a person came in complaining of numbness, tingling, we would need to, and they were on metformin as well, then we would need to uh, investigate this further. And also B12 supplementation may be needed. Metformin has also been shown to reduce uh, MI, or myocardial infarction, or heart attack in uh, patients that are overweight. We do, we do not want to use uh, metformin in hepatic failure or in uh, where the EGFR is less than 30 mils per minute. It's important to know the SADMANS acronym for sick day management. Metformin is part of the SADMANS acronym. So during an illness, a person may need to withhold the, um, the metformin. Metformin may also need to be withheld uh, during uh, examination where a radio contrast dye is being used. Finally, uh, metformin uh, has the risk of lactic acidosis. It's rare, but it's, um, it's a serious metabolic complication, and that's why you do not want to use it, metformin in hepatic failure or renal failure. And furthermore, uh, excessive alcohol intake can also increase the risk of the lactic acidosis as well. All right, that concludes the presentation. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button for more practice questions like this. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Again, thanks for watching.